Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I uh, just wanted to let you know that the new NAPLEX scores are up. They were up a couple of days ago, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, you can find a sorted version. Uh, there's the official one on NABP, but I, I sorted everything so that it's in order uh, rather than uh, order of alphabetical. I made it so that uh, you can see you know what the percentages are and things like that and that's in the pre-residency audio academy uh, that's where I kind of put everything now uh, for anybody that's uh, on their way to residency uh, I will talk also a little bit about uh, pharmacology and that those that are not passing the NAPLEX it's generally a speed thing that it's just taking too long to get through a lot of the questions and you're not sure if you got it right and things like that so when I teach pharmacology, I teach it in a specific order, always, in every course. So I taught pathophysiology in the same order that I taught physiology, that I teach anatomy, that I teach pharmacology when I'm teaching those courses. And it's just really valuable to always have in your head gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, respiratory, immune, neuropsych, cardioendocrine as a template to do that because you know when you get your rx prep book it's in different order when you get your you know pharmacology and therapeutics class are in a different order and so being the one that kind of orders everything uh, makes it a lot easier uh, to get through it and again i have that uh, pharmacology class which is uh, more for some it's p1 p2 but uh, if you've not passed the naplex and and really want some way to to kind of get all this sorted in your head uh, that's the way to do it, is to first make sure the pathophysiologic classes are always in the same order, and then that you order them as you're looking at the patient's chart. So although you know, you're looking at Rx Prep, you're generally looking at a single pathophysiologic class rather than uh, multiple ones like you would if you were in a nursing home or something like that. So again, uh, that's the self-paced pharmacology course with mobile videos and practice quizzes. Uh, anybody listening to the podcast using the code half off H A L F O F F can get that there. So what I put in the pre-residency audio academy is this uh, Excel document and I've sorted the pass rates. So what I wanted to do is, especially for those residency directors who have had to make some tough choices this uh, residency season. So when the acceptance rate went up from around 65% for PGY1 to 77%, many of the residency directors had to take applicants or are getting uh, those in their PGY1s uh, that are maybe a little bit closer to on the bubble that they may not have taken in past years. And the big issue they're going to have is going to be this uh, first time pass rate. So the first time pass rate is somewhat important. I mean, it's, it's important, but when you're going into a job and you've accepted that position, uh, generally it says in the first 90 days you have to get licensed. And here we are at the very top of the list and you know if you're getting someone from one of these schools you can be fairly certain uh, that someone that's applying for residency has gotten a job uh, is going to pass so first let's give some kudos to those top schools and i think the private schools tend to get short shrift on this because i know in u.s news only southern cal is even in like the top 50 or something like that it's incredible how they skew it so much to the publics uh, but let me just go through, I'll just do the private schools first and then the public's next. Uh, we'll just do top 25 uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about them. And then I'll talk about how there's a big mistake a lot of people make in looking at these and saying, oh my gosh, my school had an 80, that's really good. 80 is really terrible and I'll tell you why that is a little bit later. But when you're thinking about cutoffs, I'm going to give you those as well so you can know, is my school top 25%? top 50%, bottom 50%, or bottom 25%. And those numbers are pretty cut and dry. All right, so let's start with the privates. Um, I don't know, Lebanese American University, I'm just not sure. There's uh, five attempts, uh, and then um, all of them uh, ended up passing, uh, in, or four attempts, and all of them passed. Uh, so they had that um, uh, first-time pass rate of uh, 100%. And there's something really weird. I don't understand how all four can pass. 
but then the all-time pass rate is 83%. So there were some caveats with this one at the beginning in that they were talking about exactly who was testing and so forth. And you can read that uh, on the NABP chart, but uh, let's go to something that's a little more normal, but that, that's really weird that you know it's an 83% pass rate, uh, even though it was everybody passed it. So let's look at Butler. Uh, so first, Butler University um, is at 97% uh, first time, as was uh, Northeastern, and then Duquesne, 96%. Uh, uh, Southern Cal, I think, was up there. Um, yep, uh, at 96% as well. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson, 94%. And I think Incarnate Word was 94, Drake 92, uh, Western New England and Western University, uh, both again at 92. Uh, and I think that's it for the private schools. And then the, the publics, uh, you've got South Dakota State, Michigan, North Carolina, UCSD, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Pitt, uh, Georgia, Kentucky, Puerto Rico, UT, Texas, Austin, and Buffalo, as well as Rutgers, Southern Illinois, and Southwestern Oklahoma State. So again, when you look at U.S. News and World Report and you look at this, it's like, whoa, what, what's going on? This is a completely different list. And so when you're, and when we're working with pre-pharmacy students, we make clear, okay, this is what this national report says. This is what the pass rate is for the NABPLEX, and this is what it is to, to get into residency. And depending on their goals, some of those things might be more important and some of those might be less important. Uh, but it is possible to spend, I think it was $45,000 a year to have a pass rate that is close to 50%. So again, the amount of money you spend on the school doesn't really correlate well to the pass rate, just historical pass rate tends to be the, the best thing. So let's look at the, the percentages. To be in the top 25%, a school had to score over 90%. So 90% and above, that is the top quarter. And again, it even goes a little bit below. I mean, there's schools that are, you know, 90% that were not in that top 25%. To be in the top 50%, you had to have an 85 or higher, uh, and that even goes a little bit below. So uh, really 86 is really kind of that cutoff where when you're under 86%, you're in the bottom half of pharmacy school pass rates. And you say, well, you know, it's like a B, it's like middle B, right, middle 80s. But really what we're looking at is if I'm somebody who's going to pharmacy school, do I want to go to a school that's top half? Know, that I can get into for the same price that maybe I could get something in its bottom half, you know. And it's, again, it's a personal decision, but uh, just to know that 85% is where the top half is. Okay. To bottom half, now we're down at 75, or bottom quartile, now we're down at 75%. So if the school that you're at is 75% or lower on the NAPLEX, it is the bottom 25% of all pharmacy schools. And one of the things that is, you know, kind of always a hot topic is, you know, how are those new schools doing? When a new school comes out, are they going to have a very good pass rate? And historically, except for Medical College of Wisconsin, which just kind of blew it out of the water uh, and did amazingly well, the newer schools will tend to struggle in that first year and second year after that. And it's tough because what happens is, is that accreditation documentation comes late in the admission cycle. So there just aren't a ton of students that haven't, you know, the, you know, those type A students that are going to get all the A's and everything are always applying so early that it would be very tough for them to, to come to these schools. Um, but the real concern is, okay, you know, maybe you didn't pass on your first try. At least you'll pass later. What happened, though, with one of these schools is that that really didn't happen, that, you know, that that 68 percent went down significantly and that the students at that school, unfortunately, uh, are being left. I don't know how to put this in a in a in a positive light, but basically 
there is a significant percentage of the students graduating from one of the newer schools that are simply not going to get licensed or not getting licensed by their second try. And that's a real concern. Now, accreditation historically has accredited most schools. And, you know, you just don't look at the NAPLI scores. Oh, wow, you know, they're in 60s, 50s, something like that. Then, then we're not going to accredit them. That's historically not the way it's been. And I understand on the accreditation side, the last time they, they shut down two schools, one school sued them, one school changed from a four-year to a three-year program. Uh, but I don't think that got accredited. So, uh, again, um, if you are a residency director or you're somebody applying for residency, the quick and dirty is to, the quick, easiest way to say, I'm going to pass the NAPLEX. You don't have to worry about me as a candidate is top 25% is at 90, top 50% is 85, bottom 25% starts at 75. So 75, 85, and 90. Those are the, the cutoffs that you really want to look at. And if you're somebody who's in that lower group, you're maybe, you know, you got the residency, you're top of your class, but just know that they're going to be looking very carefully uh, at your data and, and they're going to be saying, okay, well, let's, um, you know, <laughs> what's our backup plan? Uh, how are we going to deal with students uh, who don't pass? And it's, it's always a question that you're never going to ask because it's such an awkward question to ask. It's like, well, what if I don't pass a NAPLEX? You know, will you still let me continue my residency? And it's up to them. They can say no and they can say yes, which can be devastating. Uh, but uh, certainly now in the job market, you would be able to uh, get another position as soon as you pass the NAPLEX. But just know the NAPLEX scores are down quite a bit. Uh, and I think that there's going to be a significant number, and this is where the kind of the real tragedy is, uh, that will never pass. And when you're talking about that, they don't really put out those kinds of numbers. But when you have, and this was kind of the big shocker, uh, where we've gone from about 14,500 to almost to 13,000. So losing about 1,300 or 10%. So we've gone down 10% in students, but the NAPLEX scores have actually gone down as well. So we would expect that, you know, if we, we lower the number of students, as many schools have to maintain quality, uh, and, you know, Northeastern is, is a great example of that, where uh, they had 112 students uh, in 2019 with the first uh, attempt at that um, NAPLEX, and now they have 76, but they had an 88% first-time pass rate, now 97, which is, you know, tops in the country. And many schools have decided, you know what, we're, we're not going to go with this trend of just accepting everybody. We're going to make sure that our students are prepared and we're, we're going to be <clears throat> good fiduciaries and, and we're going to uh, make sure that they are able to, to get employment afterwards to, to pay back their loans and things like that. And what you're seeing at the bottom is that you're getting to the point where only three out of five are going to be passing uh, the NABplex and you can, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, what do you do when you had a tuition bill of $40,000, $45,000 a year for three or four years, and now you're in no better financial shape than you were before when you were at Tech, and you just can't pass this darn test? Um, you know, who does that fall on? And so that's kind of a, maybe for a different conversation, but uh, certainly a, a difficult conversation to have. But um, one other thing I kind of wanted to mention was uh, the class sizes and where some schools, I understand Hampton uh, is, I guess you could say negotiations with uh, ACPE about that, that accreditation issue. Uh, but when we look at some of these schools, we're seeing three schools have a 50% reduction in the number that are taking uh, the first, that first attempt at the NAPLEX. And in many cases, it's to maintain or increase their, uh, uh, their quality. And the thing is, though, we're seeing, and if you go down, you know, when you get down to 36, which is about, 
I've got six blank spaces here, so you're talking about would be 42. So when you get down to the 42nd um, school down here, you're seeing that a quarter of schools had a reduction from two years ago to now of 20, about 20% 20 or greater uh, in the number of people that are attempting the NAPLEX, which is a huge number. The bigger issue is down here where you're seeing giant you know, increases in uh, enrollment or larger increases. Now, UCSF, my understanding is that this is the year of the double class where the three year met the four year and uh, that won't happen again, I'm not sure. Um, uh, North State uh, got quite a bit bigger, uh, going from 162 in a class to 111 to 118. Um, and then uh, when you got California Health Sciences University, I know that they were the ones that I think tried to get to that three year and that didn't work out. Uh, but you've got uh, almost 40% increase in the number of students there. And then you kind of go up the line. Uh, but there are a lot of percentages to kind of look at and say, all right, well, what am I doing? You know, when, when I'm looking at the schools and I'm saying, and I'm trying to you know, give good advice to somebody that's going into pharmacy school, uh, what I want to do is tell them, okay, well, here's a school that has a good you know, residency match rate, which, you know, top half is 77% now, and then has a good NAPLEX score. So good means 85 or higher, and great means 90 or higher. Uh, those are kind of easy things for me to talk about. What's a little bit more complex is when you see a school that has decrease their enrollment to increase their uh, pass rate. That's a very good thing. What you don't like to see is a school that has increased their enrollment and decreased their pass rate. And so that's saying, okay, well, maybe the acceptance rate is a bit too high. Need to uh, be a bit more mindful uh, as these students are coming in. So again, I just wanted to kind of talk about the NAPLEX and uh, getting through to and through that. Um, again, the, the big kind of take home is that if you're taking the NAPLEX, you have to have a way to sort things out in your brain. And to do that, I've just always used the exact same order from easiest to hardest in terms of difficulty. Uh, when I've taught pharmacology, physiology, pathophysiology, anatomy, uh, and that tends to resonate well. And they also take that into their clinicals where it's a lot easier uh, when you're sorting, you know, 12 medications and you've got this uh, way of knowing, okay, this is the order in my brain. It will always be in this order in my brain. Uh, and then I can catch duplicates and things like that. So uh, questions for me, TonyThePharmacist at gmail.com. But uh, again, check out your own school's NAPLEX scores. It's always kind of a point of pride when you see your school is up there and, and where it's at and that, that they did well. And of course, always a little bit of a disappointment when your uh, school doesn't doesn't make the mark. But again, you know, kudos to any school that's over 90. You know, good job for anybody over 85. And anyone under 85, you got some work to do. Uh, to make sure they get up there and uh, you know do the best for your students.